You are listening to Musings from the Rainbow Sparkle Palace with your hostess, me, Rainbow Star. You know, it's like I told me the other night, I'm tired of you putting your personal biases before the greater good of our city. Mm -hmm. It is my sincere honor and pleasure this week to introduce to you Emily LaDouceur of Bury, Kentucky, my hometown here. And just reading through her bio is super inspiring. Emily embodies the word (laughs) multi-talented. She has been a yoga instructor, she has been a meditation instructor for children, and uh, had her own podcast called Conscious Intersectionality for a while. She called it a convo cast where people called in and talked about difficult subjects. And she's organized many a citywide cleanup and participated in, in many a uh, local pride parade, much to the dismay of her detractors while running for city council as the only progressive woman on the ticket. She's currently the only progressive woman on our city council, one of two women. This interview goes in depth on her views on patriarchy, how we got here and how we can move past it, as well as details discrimination that she has faced in the workplace. Without further ado, I present to you my interview with Emily Laduser. picture of your bumper stickers because those alone are just like (laughs) I'm a badass this is what I do empowered women empower women and rape culture (laughs) yes please love it how you doing today oh you know I'm hanging in there trying to be productive this morning so what brought you to Appalachia has your family always been here or I heard that you you lived in New York for a while so I'm wondering what (laughs) what my journey was Mm -hmm. So I was born right outside Daytona Beach, Florida, Um, and when I was like three, two or three, my family moved to Western North Carolina, a little town called Andrews, North Carolina. If you know Loyal Jones, we went to rival high schools. Oh, wow. So like he grew up near where I grew up. I mean, not at the same time, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And in the 90s, I was part of a talent search. academically gifted or mm-hmm. whatever. I hope I was hoping you're gonna say hip hop dance or something. No, no. like the nineties and like yes, hip hop. <laughs> totally not. Totally more geeky um and nerdy, but um this it was a t- it's a trio program which that you have here too, um, called Talent Search and they took us on a college tour and brought us up to Berea and I found out that it was um free tuition for people living under the pro- poverty line basically and that had academic potential. I mean, so, I, yeah, so from the time, from probably mid nineties, it was where I wanted to come and it was the only college I applied to and I came here. So after I graduated, I went to grad school at EKU, but then after I graduated there, I did move to New York for eight years and worked in higher education and then came back here six going on seven years ago did you find anything alarming about differences in like new york culture around you know we're definitely in the bible belt here and i feel like for me from my view rainbow stars view christian bible belt ideology really feeds into patriarchal misogynistic culture so i'm wondering if have you like had culture shock coming here from new york because i experienced that like coming here from living in lexington for 10 years like when i moved here the fairness ordinance didn't pass like months after arriving here. And yeah, I was just like culture shocked myself just moving from Lexington. So did you experience that? So here's the thing. I would never describe it as culture shock. I mean, I grew up in a town less than 2000 people, Mm -hmm. um, much more conservative than Berea. Well, maybe not much more, but similar um, without the college piece, the, you know, the liberals, you know, Mm -hmm. The thing about living in urban areas, living up north as opposed to down south, is that by our very nature, we categorize people and we find ways to exclude each other. You are judgmental. Yeah. and I have it myself, too. I'm trying to (laughs) eke that out of myself. I hate that about myself. No, I mean, it's, it's true of almost everyone. So when living in New York, you know... The, the discrimination looked differently, but it was still there. You know, my family, 
is a blended family of sorts. You know, my children are mixed race. And I saw how if me and my ex-husband, uh, my husband at the time, would go to find an apartment, we would be turned away. But if I went by myself, I would get an application that day. I would mm. be approved that day. Like, it was so easy. We searched for weeks for an apartment together. And the first day that I went by myself, I found several apartments. Like, they were so willing to work with me. That's screwed up. Yeah. Th so there's, like, that type of experience. And then you have – there's um, heavier emphasis on class. I think there's a lot of um, poverty mentality here in the South. But up there, it was, like, poverty exclusion. <laughs> you know, where it's, like, there's such a distinct difference between the haves and the have-nots. Mm. And it's like, you can't sit with us, mm. not intentionally, right? It's not even, they're not meaning it um, in a malicious way. It's more like, like I had a mom group of friends and they'd be like, okay, well get a sitter Friday night and let's have a mom night out. And I'm like, I don't have the money for that. And it's like, oh, you know, it's like they want you to hang out, but they're like, she can never hang out because she doesn't have the money, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, that's, it's, oh <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff where mm. it's, it's just a different, we find ways to exclude each other no matter where you are. And so I wouldn't say it's a, a shock. It's just a realization of the differences or, or what the priorities are here versus mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. um, and what you need to look like to fit in here versus there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your work with the Good Men Project? Because that that is amazing and inspiring and exciting to me. So what did you experience with that? How did you get into that? Um, so it's kind of connected to why I ended up running. So I'll backtrack just a little bit and tell the story. So I, when I came back to Berea, I was working for the college. Um, and I worked there for three years. And it just wasn't a good fit for me. And so that particular summer, I had arranged for the first time for my kids to go to New York. They were finally old enough to fly by themselves. So they were going to New York to visit their dad. And I had saved my tax return that year and took my first, like, adult vacation by myself wow. and went to Puerto Rico. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And But I went there with two goals. One, to find respite because I was really stressed out mm. about the job and, and different things going on. And two, in that clearer headspace, make a decision about whether I wanted to stay in this job for another year and try to make it work and see if I could make it work and keep fighting, basically. Or should I just quit and pursue my own other passions and ventures and try to find something where I'm running either my own business or doing something that better aligns with what I feel my purpose in life is, right? So while I was in Puerto Rico, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were murdered by police. Mm -hmm. And that was a pivotal moment because it, it made the decision for me. You know, when I was sitting in my little Airbnb morning for two days instead of going out and enjoying the sunshine, and that's not to, you know, say, oh, feel sorry for me, but... It was that reflection that I went came back with and said, I'm not having the impact on the world that I'm meant to have. I'm, my voice isn't where it's supposed to be. It's not being effective. So I put in my resignation letter. I had no job. <laughs> I lined up. Well, I did have one job. I had a 15-ish to 20-ish hour a week um, set up already planned with Noodle Nirvana because it was opening, right? Cool. It had just opened, and I had talked to May, and I was like, if I quit, will you give me a 15 to 20 hours a week? I'll wash dishes. I'll do whatever. Just to have something that is, you know, some sort of stable income coming mm -hmm. in while I figured out what I was going to do. And she said, yeah, so that's what I did. And I started to, like, pursue different things. I was personal training people. I was doing meal prep here in town. I was teaching yoga. I was doing yoga gigs. I was doing lots of different things. I was trying to explore consulting on like mixed race parenting and different things. And I started writing and I met someone on Facebook who was a writer who introduced me to the Goodman Project. And I wrote an article for them and that started my relationship with them. 
and I soon became one of their editors. And then within six months, I would, had moved up to become one of their executive editors and then on their business team and helping them figure out new revenue streams and stuff like that. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, and at the time, it felt like, okay, this is a place where I can put some energy into that feels aligned um, because it was a space, if you're not familiar with the Good Men Project, it's a, a space for, well, their tagline is having the conversation no one else is having. And it's talking about modern day masculinity and what it takes to be a good person in the 21st century, basically. Um, so talking about racism, talking about sexism, talking about homophobia and providing spaces, especially for men to talk about it and it'd be okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was part of the team that kind of like, well, I oversaw for a while the social interest groups. And I started my own, which started out as mixed race parenting and relationships and quickly evolved to conscious intersectionality, which I think you are familiar with. Um, and I did a whole year's worth of weekly calls um, that centered on a plethora of issues, you mm -hmm. know, from incarceration to school to prison pipeline to um being pro-choice and Christian at the same time. And, you know, just like feminism, like tons and tons of topics. Um, that, that was a podcast that you had going on. It was, well, um, I dubbed them convo casts because um, they were kind of like podcasts, but people could call in and everybody was part of the conversation and on the recording. Cool. So, yeah, it was kind of neat um, to have those conversations and to facilitate it's, it's very difficult to facilitate those conversations, um, especially via conference call. Like mm -hmm. I hate conference calls and it's, it's so interesting now. I'm like so used to it. I love podcasts. I love radio and stuff now because of just doing that for a whole year, every week having a call. And, you know, I kind of had a, my own format where the first 20 minutes I presented kind of like the knowledge that I had on the subject matter kind of my take in a sense, um, in some ways, um, the research and then allowed for people to ask questions and discuss it, you know, share their thoughts and feelings. And, and obviously sometimes those topics get very testy and you have to just facilitate them. And, and mm -hmm. so that was a great experience. Um, but all the while I was writing a little bit here and there and I was editing and I was, you know, doing all that stuff. But, um, actually this month, Last month was my last month uh, working for them because mm. I got a new job. <laughs> Congrats! No, it's cool. It's just like a it's um, a part time researching um, for a health tech company out of Frankfurt. So Whoa. doing like competitive market research, which is really cool and exciting. Mm. And um, so I was supposed to talk about how I got here, right? Like it's okay. the, the, what, the um, whatever you feel. Well, by. there came a point, though, where even the Goodman Project and what I was doing there, I didn't feel like I was still, I did, I still, I knew I was still having an impact. Like, even working in higher ed, you, how do you not have an impact working with college students? Mm -hmm. Like, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, doing the ConvoCast and working with the Goodman Project, I felt like I was having an impact, yes. But I still didn't feel like it was the right space for my voice like it wasn't the right platform it wasn't something wasn't right and so um i actually went through the new leaders council process which is a six month training um for like 20 people selected across the state of kentucky to learn how to become either progressive business owners or run for office and it wasn't that that, that whole process was like some astounding life-changing thing but there was a particular segment of it that demystified how to run for office like campaigning learning about vote builder and numbers and win numbers and and it became a formula to me that I could see and it was felt tangible and it was like oh I could do that let me try that mm -hmm. <laughs> so I finished that process in June and announced that I was running in November and then the election was the following November. So, um, and then I have just felt like since taking this path so far that at least for now, I feel aligned with where my voice is meant to be right now in, in this world, right? Like I don't know what, how I'll feel in a year or mm -hmm. in four years or whatever, but, um, 
for me, it's just this constant recalibrating and re reflecting and making sure that my voice or that I feel that my voice is being best utilized um, to make the world better for my kids and anybody else, you know, mm -hmm. especially people who are marginalized, but, you know, so um, here we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> making big stinks and not meaning to <laughs> like I, the the truth is the things that I've brought to the fore haven't been hugely controversial what makes them controversial is who's bringing them mm -hmm. and and what they stand for in their personal lives like municipal government is like so humdrum mostly but we put partisanship onto it like it it should be things that we all agree on do we need to fix potholes yes <laughs> do we need to feed hungry kids unfortunately that becomes an issue mm -hmm. like a contentious issue mm -hmm. you know it's like but for the most part the functions of the city are not things that should be huge emotional triggers emotional disagreements mm -hmm. yeah but it's it, it comes down to well the conservatives have this idea of how things should go, mm -hmm. and the progressives have this idea of how things should go, and we're not going to meet in the middle because we don't like how you live your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aren't there any challenges that you face through throughout this, particular, like being a city councilwoman or throughout your life that really stand out for you, like specifically because you're a woman, you, you face certain challenges. Is anything that you want to talk about? I know there's like a million of them. Um, but... Where to begin <laughs> with know. that? I know. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's so many ways I could take that. I could take it personal life. I could take it political life. I could take it professional life. You know, on one of my convo casts, one of the things uh, we talked about one time, I forget what the overall topic was for the night, but in my adult life, I've never received a positive performance evaluation. Never. And not one time has any of those non-positive evaluations been related to my work. It's always been connected to some personality deficiency mm -hmm. or or um, abrasiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Like perceived when you abrasiveness. perceived abrasiveness mm -hmm. for just being a woman who is can articulate her ideas and um and there's some that might disagree and be like, no, you're just a bitch. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I'm sure there's people who feel that way. But you you know and you feel it when you you know it's because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And it's typically a man saying it mm -hmm. to you. Um, but there's women who do it too mm -hmm. that um, reinforce those patriarchal notions that women need to be quiet and know their place. And But, you know, just sitting in meetings and, I mean, it happens. It's already happened in seven months on council in the ethics meetings, in committee meetings, I'll present an idea or an issue and it'll be like ignored. And then five minutes later, one of my male colleagues will say almost the damn near same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. Oh yes, we should move forward with that. Oh my God. It's so blatant and, it's, mm -hmm. and, and I've been cut off a lot. Mm -hmm. I've had colleagues say under their breath, but to my face, you're the rudest woman I've ever met. Just at last city council meeting, the work session prior to it, we're discussing a contract that the city just entered into. Like we're three months into this brand new five year contract. And I'm trying to articulate that we don't have enough information to even talk about that right now. And the man is getting flustered with me because I'm disagreeing with him. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, you just don't understand. And I was like, right, because I'm a woman, right? Mm -hmm. I said it right in my microphone. Because mm. I'm, I'm exhausted with it. Because mm -hmm. I do know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I do understand it. And I just don't agree with how you, how you see it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, but it's so effective. It's so effective in those spaces. Because there's just this natural inclination to, to accommodate that voice, mm -hmm. you know. So anytime I speak, it's automatically like I'm pushing back. It doesn't matter if I'm saying it in a flowery way. You know, that's why I just don't care anymore. I just say what I need to say as succinctly and direct as possible without, you know, being overly emotional or hysterical about it, right? It's just I try to state the case and how I see it, but it doesn't matter. You can, you can almost feel in the room 
when it comes to my turn to speak, it's like, oh, hell, what's she going to say today? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, hell, what's she going to bring up that we have an issue with today? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I wish it wasn't like this either, folks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you think I like being the only one raising these concerns or, mm -hmm. or challenging some of your biases? You know, it's like, you know, it's like I told the other night, I'm tired of you putting your personal biases before the greater good of our city. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to continue to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> it just is what it is. Patriarchy is exhausting. I don't know if you saw that t-shirt. I have a t-shirt and a mug that says, I'm so tired of patriarchy. <laughs> I mean, it's it true. really is, though. It pervades. It's one of those things, too, that um, when we talk about society as a whole and marginalized people and different things like that. Um, the patriarchy is the overarching umbrella for all of it. And, and there's, you'll have people that will argue against that, but patriarchy has created racism, has mm -hmm. created sexism, has created homophobia, has created capitalism. It is, you know, all of these systems that we individually have issues with, and we each have our intersectional ID, I, you know, identities that are impacted by these different systems. They are all symptoms of the patriarchy, mm -hmm. and we tend to silo them out. And um, you know, I, I tried to tell, I tried to depict it in a in a way, make a mental picture for people. It's like at the very top, you have white cis hetero male Christian that is to be pedestalized and revered mm -hmm. and have the power and then but what's the one power they don't have that they can't accomplish alone um uniting people <laughs> well besides that procreating mm, that, they, can, yeah, they can't they can't procreate mm -hmm. on their own they mm -hmm. can't make babies mm -hmm. but who can make their little clones white women mm. So white women are there next to them, not necessarily as um, a powerful queen, but as a captive, mm -hmm. as a kidnapped, you know, um, collectively kidnapped under the system and forced to produce their, their offspring. And what challenges that set up, what would challenge the production of white babies? Um, I don't know what you tell me, Emily. <laughs> Black men. Um, mm. <laughs> Black men challenge that white baby production. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, and so what do you do? You incarcerate them, you kill them, enslave you them. enslave them. Mm -hmm. And then, then you look at, well, you also don't want to have more black babies. <laughs> And black women will never produce white babies. Mm -hmm. So you see at the bottom of the barrel are black women. And so there's this, and it's all under this same umbrella, but we tend to say, oh, well, racism is a system. And it's, it's more important that we talk about racism than sexism mm -hmm. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And it's all interconnected mm -hmm. and it's all under the same overarching patriarchy that impacts the world. This isn't just the U.S. You know, when when you find out that there's, what, 137,000 women, I think, murdered by male intimate partners around the world every day. Mm -hmm. There's women with their genitals being mutilated, sex trafficked. Even in our... It, it, it's so difficult for me because... It's a nuanced discussion, and mm -hmm. people don't want to talk about nuance anymore, mm -hmm. right? They want to talk about black men being murdered by police, and they don't want to talk about um, three to four women a day who are murdered by men every day mm -hmm. in our country. Mm -hmm. Just their partner, not not even like... Yeah, <laughs> we're not talking women, about in yeah. general. We're not talking about general homicides. Mm -hmm. We're talking about women. It's femicide. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about that because it's not on the camera phones mm -hmm. because it's in our homes and that's the private area, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that's the domestic area. Mm -hmm. And it's in, in that same space, it's black women are disproportionately affected by that as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, 
it's hard to have these nuanced conversations in today's cancel culture, mm -hmm. in today's um, very um, rightly so, but everyone is so emotionally charged about all of it because collectively the trauma that everyone's experiencing all the time anymore, it's unbearable. Everyone is in survival mode mm -hmm. and kind of trying it's self-preservation. And so we tend to hone in on our own experience and feel like that is all there is to know. And we will even ignore data about other people mm -hmm. or other situations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we take and apply um, systemic realities to individual mm -hmm. realities, right? Like, I don't care who you are sitting across from me, I cannot quantify or qualify your pain. Mm -hmm. That is your personal experience. I cannot say, well, because, uh, uh, because you are a white, well, I was going to say white male. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Because you're whoever in this system, you make X amount of dollars compared to me. And that suddenly becomes the conversation rather than, oh, you were raped when you were six. And you also experienced, you know, like you saw your best friend get shot. And, oh, you saw, you, you experienced this at 18. And, oh, it's not about your individual experiences and that pain that can be connected to that, it becomes about, well, you are this, I see this of you, and this mm -hmm. is what the data systemically tells me about you, and so I'm going to write you off as X, Y, and Z. And that's sometimes positive, but sometimes negative. Mm -hmm. And we fall into these traps of n losing the nuance and losing the humanity in each other because we fail to see that, you know, and meet each other at that space. Mm. Yeah, so one last question before I let you get back to your very important work. <laughs> yeah, I know you're doing a million things. You just told us all the millions of things that you're doing. Um, so what's your vision of the future, and how do you hope? I know it's a huge question. How do you hope to get there? You know, I know that you're taking baby steps. Oh, also, okay, one more question, but, okay. like, self-care. Like, how, how do you – because it's huge. I mean, it, it is so – I mean, even you just talking about the issues, like – you know, we feel it in our bodies, and so we carry that around. So, how what? How do you take care of yourself in this in this crazy ass world? Well, I mean, part of this is taking care of myself. If I'm not getting something done, then I'm not taking care of myself, you know, or taking care of the ones I love. Like it's all part of it. I don't know the self care thing. Um, I struggle with that. Not struggle with giving myself self care, but. Um, I struggle with the concept and what it's become is another commercialized, mm -hmm. you know, get your bath bombs and your massages and your spa days mm -hmm. and your go see a movie. And it, it's like spend money, go spend money mm -hmm. in, on yourself and do some treat yourself. And it's like I'm down for that every now and then. But it's like that to me is not self-care. Mm -hmm. um, self-care to me is when I shouldn't be online and talking to people or reading comments I am spending time with my children in a healthy um, human interaction type of way. You know, like turning, electro you know, the electronics off is a form of self-care. You know, um, I don't know. It's Self-care to me is just about setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's not about, like, necessarily taking and, or scheduling. I, I do schedule time to do nothing. To just do nothing, Wonderful. to not have anything on the schedule, not to have anyone that's going to call. Um, I keep my phone, but it's because I'm not stressed about it because I've designated this time. I'll get back to it. You know, like, and that took a while to get there, <laughs> but I just don't buy into this thing where it's like, you need to take a mental health day and go to the spa and get this and do that. And I know that's like not how everybody does it, but it's, you know, that's what's pushed, mm -hmm. you know, so. Doing rather than being. I take care of myself by loving people. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I like to do. I love on people. I love on my kids. I love on my friends. I spend time with people that I love. Like, there's nothing I lo enjoy more in this world than being around people that I know love me and I love them back. And we just 
are enjoying each other mm-hmm. and sitting together or doing it. The, the activity doesn't matter. We could be hiking. We could be watching a show like you sitting in this space with me right now and sharing love is, and it sounds so wonky. I'm sounding like Marianne Williamson. <laughs> I love her though. <laughs> oh gosh. She's so problematic though. <laughs> oh, but, <laughs> but I mean, that's how I care for myself. That's how, I, that's what sustains me. I will say, mm-hmm. um, now to your question about the future. Um, I'm not, I have to believe that things will get better or I wouldn't keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, Deep down, I believe that we could get through this very quickly. Unfortunately, we're we're moving at a glacial pace. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're not moving right now. We're spinning wheels. Yeah. (laughs) Reverting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, but when I think of people like Trump, um, like I can't even follow news regarding him. Like if you were to ask me like, yeah, I know the surface news, but, um, I cannot follow him too closely because that becomes a rabbit hole that it's not aligned with my purpose. Like that's not my place right now. Like maybe someday I'll be in a, a position where I could be literally fighting him or whatever (laughs) but to me I've got to focus on getting more people to believing that we can create a better world and it doesn't necessarily include him (laughs) yeah (laughs) not taking him out instead but I'm saying Mm -hmm. taking him out of this role Mm -hmm. but I'm less about arguing why he's not the choice and more talking about, well, this is what we can do together, and this is the future that we could have, and I want you to come along here. Um, it's kind of like, um, I've not gotten in an argument about it, but I'm tired of people talking about the middle. There is no middle. Mm. There's no middle. The middle, especially in our town, is right-leaning, heavy, heavily right-leaning. means you have to lean right on issues before anyone will consider you even trying to cross the aisle. No, I'm sorry. I'm not going to lean right for you to see my humanity Mm -hmm. or to see that what I'm saying is of value. Um, I'm not going to sit and argue with Trumpsters about all the stuff they love to argue about. Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to try to register people to vote who have not been engaged in the political process. I'm going to focus on rallying them and helping them understand similar to what I'm doing on council is making sure people understand what is even happening and what it means, like breaking down complex ideas and simplifying it for people who don't have the time every day to just be doing the stupid research that I do (laughs) or, you know, um, I'm just in a unique spot right now in my life where I work from home. I have this ability to uh, use my skill set, and this is what I'm saying about being aligned. It's like this is my purpose right now is to push out this type of um, energy and information. And I think what we see in Berea is really high engagement, civic engagement, that's been sustaining for several months. You know, it's not, it does peak in the valley, right? <laughs> But every time it peaks, there's more and more people that stay engaged. Mm. You know, there's the people that show up and then they leave after the issue is kind of settled. But every time there's more and more people, you know, like, man, I should I should come to these city council meetings more often. And I'm like, yes, you should. Some of them are very boring, but um, you're so much more aware and you're such a more informed voter. You know, where it's not, you're not relying on what people say in a forum, you know, at the end of the day, in the ninth hour, and um, you have real, like, live experiences. And it also helps because having those faces in the crowd challenges people to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. If If you look out there and all you see are Berea moderates, not much challenge to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but if like the other night, 
you look out and it's packed house and it's like it was three fourths in opposition. That's difficult. Oh, I wish we had talked about the Human Rights Commission budget because I'm working on that too. You have to go to work. What time is it? Eleven thirty. Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so wrap it up. Yeah, okay. We'll have to do it again. Um, but... Well, you know, we'll... I can talk for hours. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for You're talking welcome. with me today. And is there anything else that you want to say? To... I'm always open to helping anyone understand any of the decisions I've made as a council member, or helping them just understand the processes and the things that go on in our city in general. So an open book, as you can see, I'm pretty, um, put stuff on the table, like Mm -hmm. all cards laid out on the table. I'm pretty honest about it. Um, so just hit me up. Okay. How can people find you? You can email me at Emily for Berea, the words, not numbers at gmail.com or call me 859-694-0533. Or you can stop by City Hall. I have um, office hours on Mondays from 11 to 1 and Thursdays 12 to 2. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) This face-to-face interview was recorded in August, and I realized I had a couple more things that I really wanted to ask Emily about. So here is that phone interview. I wanted to ask you about Leggings Gate, a.k.a. the uh, infamous Watergate of Leggings that happened in Berea. <laughs> you, if you're willing to talk to people about what happened and um, your response and the community res- response to that. Sure. So basically, we have a hate group here in town. And unfortunately, they bully myself and a few other progressive um citizens of the town online a lot and um, I had given a tour of City Hall to a group of um, kids from the elementary school uh, who were doing like a career college um, career bound focused thing and I was wearing a dress shirt and some black leggings, professional, you know, some booties looked nice and professional. (laughs) And um, the city posted pictures of me giving this tour, and this group decided to post the picture um, edited with my face smudged black over it um, and said, what is this black cloud over Berea? Um, And then someone commented down below and it was a man who had run for city council the same time I did and lost who said something to the effect of why does a big girl think leggings are appropriate or think she can wear leggings and um, total body shaming total just policing of women's attire and bodies and everything else and um, you know the first day, you know, when I saw the screenshot, you know, what happens is people send me screenshots when these things happen. And um, it was hurtful. I felt like garbage. I wanted to crawl into a hole and and disappear. Um, and then I, you know, I got a good night's sleep and woke up the next day and kind of responded in my own way by Um, On my council Facebook page, I basically posted the link to where I buy the leggings that I wear and said, you know, just got really cheeky with it and said, you know, with all this interest in my leggings, I figured I'd share where I buy my professional attire if anyone else would like to buy them and if they feel uncomfortable um, being intelligent and curvy at the same time, they can know that they have a councilwoman that supports them and represents them. Um, And that is kind of what sent the thing a little more viral. There were two different um, community events that popped up out of the incident. Um, Hashtag Berea wears leggings. And basically the next business day, which was a Monday, I think this came out on a Friday, and then on the next Monday, 
everyone wore leggings to work and they took a picture and they posted it with the hashtag and and then that Tuesday, which was when our next city council meeting was, a lot of folks showed up, including men who work construction and things like that in leggings in to show support. So it just kind of caught and Lex eighteen picked it up and then Louisville Courier picked it up and then the Today Show picked it up and then George Takei um picked it up. So it went national and even international. It was the article was translated in Hungary or Hungarian. Um Aww. so yeah, so you know, that's what happened. It was it it really did um backfire on them and it made them go take their group and close the privacy on it to where it wasn't public anymore, which was really great because they were just sharing out really hateful messages and and what people were able to do at that point it got national attention was go in there and see all the racism homophobia and just bigotry and religious discrimination that they were promoting constantly and they were shamed um on a national level and so it helped to kind of quell their their noise but that's what happened and (laughs) I'm kind of because, you know, some people just know me because of that event, so, you know. That's awesome. And I have to say, too, I was really confused when I first saw the picture and what was going on on Facebook because for me, looking at the picture, it looked like you were dressed in business casual black work pants. Like, I would Mm -hmm. never have known that those were leggings. So I'm like, what? These people have got to be so bored out of their minds. And they're like following and you know I don't know how they even knew that those were leggings I mean for for one and for two you looked amazing <laughs> so, thanks and, and there and also like in the photo here you are describing to young children who are there about you know about city government and about your job and I just thought that was super cool what you're doing and how stupid that they that they took that and tried to make it into something negative and I'm so glad that it backfired uh, in a in a positive way for you and for a lot of other people I'm sure that felt emboldened to buck this idea that other people get to say what they wear which is ridiculous and something that I don't think men deal with nearly as much as women do so good for you <laughs> Thanks, and absolutely not. It's definitely something that happens to women. Um, I think I made a tweet soon after that, too, that was like they talked about Hillary's pantsuit. They talked about AOC's earrings. They talked about Attica Scott in our state, her hairstyle, and then with me, my leggings. Like, men just don't get this kind of scrutiny, and Mm -hmm. it's intended to silence us and to make us feel less powerful and so it was really great that the community supported me. Like, I've, I've never felt so supported. It was amazing. That's awesome. And you had, like, three different interviews, like, TV interviews that were on, like, international news, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, the Today Show went, you know, featured it, but they used, like, Lex 18's, um coverage, I think. Uh, WBON did a really nice um, interview, and it was, it was actually a really great learning experience for me, too, to learn how media kind of works and how I have more or I had more power to create the narrative that I wanted to than I thought I did. So, you know, the first few I did, I just did what I thought was right, you know, and just answered the questions. Um, the one that Yahoo Lifestyle posted up was a little bit inflammatory because I did say that these were just salty men who um, don't like the fact that they're sexually attracted to women in power and that frustrates them. Um, (laughs) And that quote was probably like out of an hour long interview, they pulled that, you know, kind of inflammatory quote. I was like, oh, gosh. But then by the last one, which was WBON, you know, I was able to work with the reporter and I I asked her, I said, do you mind if we try to put a positive spin on this? and make it less about me and feature one of the local businesses that supported me. Um, so they allowed, we did the interview in Native Bagel and they featured Katie Starksman, who is a woman who's running, you know, her own business and all of her workers wore leggings that day and they, they had it on their story timeline and stuff. And, you know, it was a 
great kind of like spin to highlight a local business and and take some of the, you know, it just took the the wind out of all the negativity, you know? Yeah. And one thing I remember from seeing an interview with you that I thought was so brilliant, you said something along the lines of, you know, isn't it interesting that we're focusing here still on my attire? Like, can we focus on the issues that I am working to positively change in my community instead? <laughs> Mhm. I mean, and that's the but that's the goal, right? They want to distract people from the work you're actually doing. Um, it's and that I think progressives around anywhere are dealing with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, um, lastly, I I wanted to ask if you had any advice for any women that were thinking about running for city government or for public office. You know, I've thought about writing a guide for women to run, um, but like a small, very easily read handbook um, for local races. I think for women, you just have to be in a place in life where you really know yourself and have a, a strong awareness of what you might be up against in terms of what is what is real criticism and what is coming from a sexist place or from patriarchal conditioning or, you know, things like that. And having that awareness helps you kind of deal with it better um, because it doesn't feel as personal. It's like, you know, it's coming from another place. But um, I think having a good support system, I mean, I did it with very little money, but money goes a long way, unfortunately. Um, And I think just you have to be in a place in life where you can even afford it. It's not cheap to be um, in public service to this degree. You know, I make 400 bucks a month um, doing city council, and um, <laughs> that's not enough to feed my family. So, you know, it's, this is why we see older, retired white men in office a lot, because they have the money and the time mm-hmm. to to do the job. You know, it's like, it, this, this, I'm in almost one year now of my term, and it's um, not killing me, but it's it's a struggle because I'm still trying to pay rent. Like I'm the only renter on the city council. I'm the only person who doesn't, you know, isn't living financially comfortably. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah. it's um, and and that kind of instability definitely puts me in a different place of how much I can commit, my capacity, and I end up pushing myself too much sometimes because you have to be superwoman. You have to do it all, and you have to be engaged, but you also have to, you know, I've got two kids to feed, and, you know, you got to survive and pay your bills. So, I mean, I think for women who want to run, you just got to make sure you have a strong support system, be very honest about where you are in life, and be ready um, and stay strong. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I have to say, to me, you are as close to a real life modern day superwoman as it gets. I was looking through your <laughs> website the other day, and just it's so inspiring to see a woman who has not only given herself in so many different areas of service, but also has expertise in just such a broad range of subjects, like. You've had such a full life, and how old are you now? Like, thirty-eight. Thirty-seven. <laughs> thirty-seven. Damn. <laughs> uh, what a full life. So, uh, I'm well, I feel like I haven't even achieved anything yet. So, I think that that's part of the lifelong learning piece that drive keeps me going. You know, there's always something more to learn and some way to get better. Yeah. Agreed. Amazing. <laughs> well. I think that's all that we even have time for in addition to what we've got. So I'll put the, <laughs> I'll put the extended interview. I'm going to have two. The podcast itself will have two. I'll have, like, the radio version and then the extended interview for, like, local people who really want to hear the nitty-gritty de- details of council that we talked about in the beginning of our face-to-face interview. So that's awesome. Oh, Is there anything that awesome. I can do to help you, like, in the future? Just let me know. Or today, is there anything you're working on that I can help you out with? <laughs> I mean... It's like, it's just stay engaged. You know, I need people to stay engaged. Unfortunately, we're in a culture where we have these, like, moments of outrage, and then we just kind of, like, forget about everything again, and we and we um, log out. And 
it's especially for local politics, you just have to stay on top of it and you have to stay engaged and pay attention. And, and I, tr- I try my best to highlight what's important that's going on or what I need for folks to know about and communicating with your elected officials. It does put pressure on them. They may not always listen, but it does put pressure on them and being consistent with that pressure. Um, you know, I said we're making 400 bucks a month and some of these people are in these roles just for the prestige of it. They don't really want to see Berea get better. And all this pressure and stuff that they're not used to is kind of, I get the sense that some are like, this is not worth it. And that's a good thing. Like if you, if you're not in it to be, you know, making change, then you need to step aside and let someone else, you know, take the reins. And I think that it's key for our community, they've never been this engaged in local politics, and we just have to keep it keep it up. Hey, women, thank you so much, Emily, for taking time out of your busy day. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Wow, it was beautiful to sit with Emily, and I hope that you learned a lot today. The question of the week that I would like to pose to you in light of Emily's interview is regarding sexism in the workplace, write in and let me know what your experiences have been and if you're okay with me sharing that on the air. The contact is info at rainbowstarmusic.com. You can always find the show notes at rainbowstarmusic.com slash podcast. You can listen to the podcast on any of your favorite platforms, including Spotify and YouTube. Just search musings from the Rainbow Sparkle Palace. You can find us on Insta at Palace Podcast. This episode was written, edited, and produced by me, Rainbow Star, and the background music is also written by me. New episodes release every Wednesday, so keep coming back. You're welcome to subscribe, rate, review, and share, and let others know that feminist voices are well worth hearing. Stay fierce, stay sparkly.